Welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast, where it's all about fixing your relationship without your man's conscious effort so that you feel desired and taken care of and special, even if your relationship feels completely hopeless. I'm Laura Doyle, and today I'm talking about five bogus facts about boundaries. My guest Racine was working hard to be the perfect wife, but she was stuck in a never-ending conflict between her husband and her parents. As much as she tried to smooth things between between them, the tension only got worse. But today, her husband and her family get along much better, and she enjoys the intimacy and connection with her husband and feels a lot more relaxed. Next, I'll be giving out the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award, which is super common and makes me shudder. I'll explain why. All that is coming up, but first, let's talk about five bogus facts about boundaries that everyone thinks are true. You have to set boundaries in relationships, right? Everyone knows that. But what if you don't? Since boundaries are places at the edge of countries where soldiers with guns stand to defend their territory, you got to ask yourself, do I really want that in my marriage? I know I don't. Barbed wire and gun turrets don't do much for intimacy. You might be thinking, that's a different kind of boundary, Laura. But in my early marriage, there wasn't much difference. I meet lots of other women who are as confused as I was. They say, I set a boundary. I let him know it's not okay to stay out late drinking with his friends and leave me alone with the kids. Or I told him he had to end his friendship with that woman at work because that was violating my boundary. Or as I used to say, I don't appreciate being spoken to that way and I won't accept it. Of course, I want to honor myself. I want to say how I'm feeling and what I want. I want to feel important and desired. I want to be treated well. Today, I have all that in my marriage, but setting boundaries didn't help me get there. Here are five bogus facts about boundaries and what to do instead. Number one, boundaries make relationships better. In the battle days, when I was setting a boundary, it came out of a feeling of anger. I was furious, you know, or If I'm more honest, I was actually hurt. And therefore, by the time I got around to speaking my truth, it came out laced with sarcasm and criticism and resentment. For example, if I said, I don't appreciate being spoken to that way and I won't accept it, that included a pretty loud subtext that he was a jerk and that he had just ticked me right off. I was a big fat hypocrite because I was criticizing him for being critical and blaming him for blaming me. And that pretty much guaranteed that I wasn't going to get a good response, like an apology or a hug, because that's not how human beings are made. Even if you're married to a Congressional Medal of Honor recipient, I promise he would rather run into enemy fire than try to hug you when you're on the warpath like that. When I feel criticized, I get defensive. And that's true no matter how right the other person is. It stands to reason that my husband reacts the same way. Criticism has never improved our relationship, not one single time. Therefore, to teach someone else how to treat me and still preserve the intimacy that I value so much, I speak only for myself and I avoid criticizing him. I say what I mean, but I don't say it mean. One way to do this is, as an example, would be to simply say, ouch, and nothing else. I'm honoring myself by admitting I'm hurt, but I'm not criticizing or blaming my husband. Now, it takes some guts to say it, I'll admit, but the response, typically tender and apologetic, that's so much better than I ever got from angrily criticizing him and calling it setting a boundary. Number two, boundaries are a way to take care of yourself. This is a second fallacy, that they're a way to take care of yourself. So this is another common pothole that I used to fall into a lot. Uh, it was taking my husband's problems on as my own problems instead of trusting him to figure things out for himself as he had done for over 30 years before I met him. And that resulted in me applying myself to things that were not my concern. They were not my area of expertise. And they exhausted me and stressed me out sometimes. For example, I took it upon myself to help him find a better job, which meant I appointed myself his career counselor. I redid his resume and you're welcome. I found job leads for him. When he didn't appreciate any of that, I was upset. 
I set a boundary by saying, well, you can just do all this by yourself without my help then because you don't appreciate anything I do. I was charming like that. In retrospect, I'm sure he was relieved, except for the part where I explained what a jerk he was for not thanking me profusely. As you can imagine, that didn't exactly make him feel lovey-dovey toward me. These days, I stay out of that kind of trouble by minding my own business in the first place. And that saves me from having lots of completely unnecessary resentment. If nobody asks for my help, that means they don't need it or they don't want my help. If they did, they would tell me. Even if they're hinting about it, I don't have to read anything into that. And I typically don't. That's because I trust other people are the experts in their own lives and they can speak for themselves when they want something from me. And that includes my husband. That's my practice. That's my ideal. I I listen and I sympathize at times, but I stay away from putting myself in charge of solving my husband's problems unless he asks directly. And sometimes even then, I use a magical phrase to stay out of trouble. What is that? Oh, well, I'm glad you asked because here's fallacy number three is that you shouldn't let your boundaries get crossed. Now, if you think of your own limits as a mere mortal woman, uh, instead of gun torts, when you think of boundaries, and if you think of acknowledging those limits before you exceeded them, not after, then this one is actually true. And if that's how you think boundaries are, then then this is true. In the old days, deciding that my husband had crossed my boundaries was a license to rip into him. But in retrospect, there could be only one person truly responsible when I was overwrought or depleted or otherwise bent out of shape because my limits had been violated. And that person's me. I'm the one who betrayed myself by staying up too late to take him to the airport or getting too lonely because I was just waiting for him to come home when he was out with a friend or working too hard to pay all the bills that I feared he couldn't handle. These days, I'm pretty good at asking myself if I'm going to be resentful before I do something, and that serves me very well. If anyone asks me to do something that will leave me feeling frenzy or depleted or otherwise not my best self... I respond with this magical phrase, I can't. That's it. I can't. That's it. Being brave enough to disappoint my husband and other people I care about at times is worthwhile because it helps me keep my dignity and stay pleasant most of the time and also avoid blow-ups. If I go past my limit and my husband happens to be in the vicinity when I decide to overdraw my energy account, getting angry at him won't somehow restore my self-respect at all. But acknowledging my limits to myself up front has been a lifesaver and a marriage saver. One student experimented with this phrase when her husband asked her if she could water the vacationing neighbor's lawn that day. She simply said, I can't. And he just said, oh, it was uncomfortable for a few moments. And then he figured out a plan B, which was for him to do it later that day. So he solved the problem himself and she didn't overextend herself and become resentful or lose her dignity by informing him of her boundary. Right. Number four, the number four fallacy, bogus fact about boundaries is that boundaries make others straighten up. This one just isn't my experience. Not the way I use boundaries or the way I see other women using them, which is as a way to try to control someone else. And that's because boundaries are thinly veiled ultimatums. They're thinly veiled threats. It's human nature to rebel against an ultimatum or a threat. Being threatened brings out the I'll show you and all of us. I remember thinking that if I made threats, it would make my husband realize just how thoughtless he was being and reconsider his actions. But that never, ever worked. Not even one little bit. It didn't protect me from suffering what I felt was his bad behavior. And me putting him on notice, that just gave us wall-to-wall hostility. These days, I don't feel at all tempted to make threats or ultimatums because my husband is inspired to make me happy. All I have to do is be my best self, the the me that I really want to be anyway, the way I want to show up. And my husband responds to me better. Number five bogus fact about boundaries is that they are non-negotiable. Boundaries often end up being things like, I'm letting you know right now, I'm never going to your brother's house again. Or 
Next time you need a ride to the airport, don't ask me. But those kinds of announcements, the kind that are from now on and forever, are just sideways forms of saying, I hate you right now. It may feel satisfying in the moment, but they leave little room for the possibility that you'll feel differently about something in the future. And they certainly aren't conducive to intimacy as they tend to leave a cold frost in the room. I notice that my relationship requires ongoing negotiations, and there are very few things that I can decide about now and forever. Instead, I prefer to check with myself in every moment and just decide if I'll go to his brother's house this time or next time or maybe the time after. Or maybe I'll drive him to the airport or maybe I won't. I'll decide in the moment. I can still do that and be my best self, you know, the calm, self-possessed Laura that I like to be, not the angry and resentful one. Either way, I know I'll be able to honor myself as that situation arises, and I won't need a strong military to do it. It's true that we're always teaching people how to treat us. Setting boundaries never got me the tender, playful, passionate treatment I have now, but focusing on and honoring my own feelings and desires has helped give me everything I wanted when I thought I needed all that defense. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at GetCherished.com. Go to GetCherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. My guest, Racina, was working hard to be the perfect wife, but she was stuck in a never-ending conflict between her husband and her parents. As much as she tried to smooth things between them, the tension only got worse, which created a lot of stress and made her resent both her family and her husband. She was also exhausted from her full-time job and her kids, but today... Her husband and her family get along a lot better, and she enjoys intimacy and connection with her husband and feels a lot more relaxed. She's going to tell us how she did that. Racina, welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast. Thank you. Thank you so so much. Yeah. So uh, tell us about the bad old days with your your marriage uh, being under all this stress and, of course, even your relationship with your own parents. Oh, yeah, so this issue was a, the one between my husband and my parents. It was a recurring issue throughout my marriage, and it started within about a week of our wedding. So we, it was after our first visit to my home after we got married. My husband shared how unhappy he was with the welcome, or rather lack thereof, that he got from my family. And I had no idea how to respond. I was taken aback. I was confused. I was dismissive of his concerns and I was embarrassed as well. And I just, I had no idea how to respond to that. Um, I don't remember how that conversation ended, but that was far from the end of that conversation because it kept coming up again and again and again. Almost every time we spent time with my family, there would be something or the other that that happened or that he would bring up that he was unhappy about or he was offended by. And the difficult, most difficult part about it for me was that he wanted me to do something about it. He wanted me to convince them to be to change their ways or to to behave differently towards him. And that was ridiculous for me on multiple levels because at, I mean, first off I was like, how, how do I make my, my, how do I make my entire family change their ways? And secondly, why, why do I need to get my entire family to change? Um, And on the other hand, I kind of did feel guilty and, uh, worried about it because he would contrast it with the way I was treated by his family, which was really wonderful. They were very welcoming. They were very warm towards me. There was a definite difference between the way his family treated me and the way my family treated him. So I did feel like 
I should do something about it because he did. He definitely did things to make sure that his family treated me well. Like I, he, there were sp- specific things that he did to make sure that I felt welcome at his home. And so I, I felt like, yeah, maybe I should be doing something, but that was just not me. Like I didn't know what to do. First of all, I didn't know if it would work. It was just, it, it was a, it was more than I could. I was willing to take up. It was more than I wanted to take up it was just I didn't know what to do with the situation really and my solution was just to make sure that I was the perfect wife like I couldn't control my family but I need to be perfect so that you know at least that part of it is you know sorted because that's the only thing I could control Uh, and so no matter what I did he would always tell me like you know whenever this conversation would come up he would say you're amazing I love you you're just you're such an amazing wife but your family is a huge disappointment it was like you know it was always part of the same conversation and that was just like it was so defeating I mean I just felt so frustrated by that I just it it felt like you know no matter what I did this would always be there Uh, he made it very clear that my family was an integral part of our marriage our family our families were an integral part of our marriage how many years did this go on so this was um (laughs) I've been married for 10 years now, so I'd say 10 years, just like just until I started code training almost. So, yeah. Yeah. So was there a moment where you thought, wow, this is, we can't go on like this. Uh, so the thing is that it spilled over into other areas of our marriage as well, because the way these conversations would occur, uh, he would, he has this habit of like thinking up the worst case scenarios for everything it wasn't just this it's just his way of thinking like he's like you know what if this happens we need to be prepared for that and so what he would talk about when it came to us was he would say you know if our marriage if something happens to us if you know our marriage becomes rocky then we need like you know the family is supposed to be like the the second line of support like if something happens to us they are the ones that are supposed to help us you know get back together again they're supposed to be our you know support net and we don't have that. So if something happens to us, then our marriage could get really bad really quickly. And whatever he was trying to say to me, it sounded like a threat to me. <laughs> I felt like he never put it across that way, but that's all I could hear. It felt like a threat. I felt threatened. I felt manipulated. I felt controlled. I felt compelled to do like whatever he wanted me to do about the situation. And Even if I did feel that way in the moment, uh, eventually I would be like, no, I can't really do anything about my parents. And so I would, all of that pressure would just come to come back to me. Like I need to be perfect. I need to make sure that I am perfect (laughs) so that nothing ever happens to us. So that the situation that he's talking about never, never materializes. And so I would just take on anything and everything that he expected like it wasn't maybe it wasn't even expecting but I was operating out of fear (laughs) I guess at some level and like you said I was working full-time I had two young kids that I was taking care of I was living with his family and I was also taking on multiple tasks because I work from home so you know like running errands or you know paying the bills whatever it was I would just take it on I would be like yes I'll I'll do this I'll do that you know whatever I felt like I had to be perfect (laughs) To save our marriage. It felt like that to me. So part of being perfect um, was that you would do everything. You would work and be a mom yeah. and pay the bills and do all the errands. And so you yeah. were you were tired. Yeah. Yes. And I thought I what I really wanted, I was hoping that one day he would finally say to me, like, oh my God, you are amazing. I I, I don't care about your family anymore. This is just, you know. I'm so happy with you, but I never heard that. It was always, no matter what I did, he would always ask me to do something else. So there was always something else that he wanted from me. You know, he would just say it like, you know, do this or do that. And I, I felt like he was doing this to me on purpose. I felt like he was, you know, he was trying to squeeze every last bit out of me. Like he was just pushing me to my limits. I just felt, I, I felt very victimized. I felt like he knew what he was doing at some level. I felt like he knew I, I I felt like I had to do these things and he just he was just trying to get the most out of it. So wow. yeah, that so was you were like, that was the bad old days. Yeah, so you were exhausted like and you were kind of like the the servant at your home. Yeah. 
so so what happened so the funny part is that I loved him. He was a great guy. There were many things that I really liked about him and I and that's the reason I worked so hard because I didn't want to lose that marriage. I really did like him. I love him very much. But when I was at my lowest, there was always this fantasy that I had about being married to this other guy somewhere who wouldn't care about you know cuz i felt like this guy cared like he just i i couldn't you know i couldn't ask him not to care about this because it was important to him like i can't do anything about that but i imagine that somewhere in the world out there there was this guy who didn't who wouldn't care about my family and who would just make our marriage about the two of us and who would just love me for who i am and we would be so happy together and since it was a fantasy you know why settle so i would he would also be you know a, a better a better parent uh he would be uh he would ha- have the same parenting uh, ideologies that i did he would be more considerate he would be a better son in law you know i just had this fantasy about this man that was out there somewhere with whom i would be so happy and the funny part was that there was a voice in, inside my head that was sometimes and asked me but you know would this guy really love you as much as your husband does and I don't know. And with this guy, uh, you know, would he be as adventurous? I don't know. Would he take you on impromptu road trips? Well, I don't know, but you know, I felt like I couldn't have it all. So maybe I would just be happier with this other guy. It was just this fantasy, right? It was just this conversation that I had with myself. And I felt like, yeah, I couldn't have it all, but to be honest, I couldn't choose between one or the other. Like which one would I be happier with? But at my lowest moments, I felt like maybe I would just be happier with that other guy. You know, the one that just didn't care about my family. I love that you're sharing this because I relate to this too. When my marriage was, was really painful. I remember having the same, like there's some other person. I just married the wrong one. There's this other guy out there that, that really would, you know, then we would just be so happy together because he would, you wouldn't be, yeah, I wouldn't have these same challenges that I have now. Yeah. And so, okay, so so you went and found Fantasy Guy. <laughs> well, so the reason I shared that is because I actually had trouble identifying as someone, identifying myself as someone in a troubled marriage because there were things about my marriage that I really did like and for the most part we were happy when my parents were not in the picture we were happy i was happy with him we had good we had great times together but there was this huge issue that felt like a sword hanging over our marriage like threatening to cut us apart at any moment and that was like a huge weight that just wouldn't disappear that was the biggest challenge for me so i i never felt like i needed to seek help for my marriage and yet i guess part of me like deep inside just really wished i had a better marriage you know I, it's like it's I, i guess there was this dichotomy so so i became aware of some of your coaching programs because i was i was suggesting your book to a cousin of mine and i was just reading up about your organization and i found out like i had read the surrendered wife way back uh, and i really loved it and i was suggesting surrendered wife to a cousin of mine and I just looked you up this was a cup like maybe a year ago and I found out that you had so much more like you had the empowered wife and you had this huge coaching organization and and you had these programs and I came across the ridiculously happy wife first and I remember thinking to myself like wow I really wish I could you know I could find out what it is that she's teaching these people it seems silly like why would I go seek support for my marriage it, you know so I just I really wished at that point like I could get someone to sign up for it and then tell me what's in there but I just let that go and then a couple of uh, months later I I came across coach training and that was like and I remember the description said like intimacy skills training at the highest level with Laura Doyle and I was like oh, I want that and it, it was perfect because I was not saying like you know I'm I'm in trouble my marriage is in trouble I'm just saying I want to learn to become a relationship coach and that really spoke to me as well like it was this desire that I didn't even know I had I really wanted to be a relationship coach it sounded amazing and it was perfect like I could go tell my husband I want to become a relationship coach and then hopefully I would you know get all these <laughs> all these insights about what I could possibly do for my marriage and so that's what I did <laughs> Wow, I love that. Cuz so well, you didn't feel 
that you needed the support really directly, but you wanted to support other women. And then secretly you're like, maybe I'll also, you know, make my marriage <laughs> even more. Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, yes. I'll unburden my marriage is kind of how I hear it. Yeah. You have that sort of Damocles hanging over your head. So, okay. Yeah. So, so what did happen? You got into coach training and. I got into coach training and um, wow, like every every skill that I learned, it just, it changed so much in my marriage. I remember thinking like, you know, my marriage is good. So what if, you know, what if I don't get all these transformations that people keep talking about and, you know, what's it going to be like for me? And I really was wondering because, you know, this issue between my husband and my parents was not about us. It wasn't about me and my husband. It was about them. So like, is it going to be relevant at all? Like, am I, am I going to get anything out of this? I don't know. But I just, I just told myself like, you know, if nothing else, at least I become a coach. So, you know, it's not like, you know, <laughs> I get something out of it. Um, so, so then I got introduced to the skills and first came self-care and that was nothing like I had ever done for myself ever before. <laughs> so I, I learned to put myself first and, and, and try to make myself happy. And, and that was very, you know, it, I would say like each skill just, just brought so much to my marriage. Like my husband seemed more attracted to me when I started doing self-care. I have a little story about that that keeps oh, coming to hear. mind. I I share. So when I first started um, practicing self-care, and I think also that it was just me having said yes to myself in signing up for coach training. I guess I just showed up as a much more happier person, but it wasn't conscious. I never realized that I was showing up differently at all. What happened was that one day I went out for a morning walk with my husband and on the way back, uh, and I was not dressed in anything pretty at all. I was like, you know, wearing my, <laughs> you know, the, you know, my track pants or, <laughs> and my sneakers and whatnot. Um, and we were sitting together. He was driving back and a song comes on over the radio and it's a uh, local song. So it was the translation. It was like pretty woman, pretty woman. And my husband turns to me and he's like, he's calling you. And I was, I almost fell off my chair because that was nothing like my husband at all. Uh, you know, the kind of person he he is, I would have, you know, if he'd said something insulting, I would have, you know, I would have immediately known what he was referring to. Like if the song was, you know, if it had some insulting lyrics and it said, oh, he's calling you, if it would have been a joke, he wouldn't have been trying to be mean, but I would have immediately known what he was talking about. But with this, I actually had to think for a second, like, is, is that what he's actually referring to? Or is he talking about something else? I'm not sure. But I just looked at him and I smiled. And then a few seconds later, the lyrics changed and he said, oh, he stopped. And I was like, what? He was actually just telling me that I'm a pretty woman. And, you know, for no reason whatsoever. It was, it was so unlike him. It was so gratifying. It was, it was like, I, I started realizing that all of these parts of my marriage that I didn't even know I was missing. When wow. That's what happened. Wow. Yeah. I love that. So you didn't realize this was going to happen, but you created this kind of connection and um, like a playful, and uh, you became the irresistible magnet to your husband. It sounds like. Yeah, I did. Wow. What about the relationship with your parents? How, how is uh, so that, what happened there was that I, my coach suggested to me that I relinquish control of that relationship, which sounded incredibly scary uh, because I thought, you know, I'd been working so hard to make sure that they get along better, that if I stop, then everything's going to collapse. It's going to, you know, everything's going to blow up and uh, I don't know who's going to pick up the pieces after that. But I did it because, you know, she, she had a good story about it working for her. So I said, okay, you know what, I'm going to try this. And I did. And it's been amazing. I can't believe, like, I can't believe how much better things have gotten since I just let go of that since I decided that what happens between my husband and my parents is none of my business it's it's for them to work out for themselves wow and so do they do they still fight no i mean i don't think 
I mean, there have been small incidents that happened between them as well, but it was more about just me getting pulled into it so often. Like he would complain to me and they would say things to me and I kept feeling like I needed to go in and fix it or, or do something about it. But I just don't feel that pressure anymore. You know, if my husband has anything that he wants to talk about, I'm here to listen and that's all I'm going to do, you know, I'm... <laughs> Yeah, I can't do anything about it. And I'm just, yeah, and, and his feelings are very valid. Uh, in the past, I used to feel like I needed to dismiss it so that I don't get, you know, I don't get pulled into it or that I, I, I make sure that he changes his opinion about it. But no, he's he's valid in thinking whatever he thinks. He has a very, he has very valid points of view. My parents have very valid points of view. You know, it's all, it's all good. And it's fine. It's okay. And oh, but, but like literally things have gotten so much better. They have actually gotten gotten better between them like one of the things that my husband used to complain about was that my mom never visit never visited us and my mom would say that she doesn't you know she just doesn't feel like she gets anything out of visiting us because you know I'm always busy with my work and uh you know it's just she just feels like I don't know un not unwanted but she just you know she never knows what to do when she's with us I guess and even if she did come I would be like on tenterhooks just wondering what's going to happen what's you know is everything going to go be okay in this visit it was uh that's that's what it was like before but you know since I did this my mom came and stayed with us for three days which was much longer than she'd ever stayed with us before uh in a very long time and um it was great my mom when she got she returned she told me she had a wonderful time with us and I was not worried about it at all I was just focusing on enjoying my time with my mother and you know just having fun with her <laughs> it was great and this is just one example of, of so many little interactions that have been so much better since I just relinquished control of the relationship so, so was that pretty scary though for you to relinquish control because in the past you're just thinking okay I got to get through this visit and try make sure there's no conflict or tension. And this time you were just so relaxed. How, how did you do that? Well, it was the most terrifying part of it for me was just relinquishing control of it in my mind, like saying that, I am not going to try and step in and fix anything. Uh, I don't even have to worry about this anymore. Whatever is going to happen is going to happen. That was the scariest part, like shifting that mindset. And so what, uh, what about being the perfect wife? Do you still work and so that? And yeah, that took another skill altogether. That took vulnerability and um, just the idea that I could say I can't. Like I could ask myself, you know, is doing this going to make me resentful, or you know, do I want to do this? And if I don't, I could just say I can't. Um, that was again, mind blowing for me. And again, very terrifying because, you know, this was the other part of, you know, what was keeping my marriage together. Or so I thought, like, I thought that, you know, me doing every single thing that I should be doing as a perfect wife is what's, you know, holding my marriage together right now. And so letting go of that and saying, no, nope, I can't was the, the idea of letting go of that was terrifying but I let go of so much. I gave up my full-time job I no longer do so many of the things that I used to feel like I had to do before. So, Rosina, wasn't he mad when you stopped doing everything? How, how did he react to that when you quit your job? So, when I quit my job, he was actually pretty cool about it. Um, he was concerned about the money, of course, but he was also very responsive to my you know to my vulnerability because when I went to him and I said I just can't do this anymore I just can't keep doing everything he was very concerned and he immediately wanted to step up and and relieve me of that burden and that was so gratifying to see uh, just to to realize that it wasn't about me juggling my job and my and my and my parenting responsibilities and all of that that made you know, that made him happy with me. It wasn't about that at all. It was such a relief to see that. Um, and so I just loved the way he responded to that. It, it, he didn't, you know, I didn't quit my job the next day. It wasn't that quick, but just his response was so heartening to me. 
on the other hand some of the smaller everyday things um he didn't respond as well because he was just so used to me jumping up to do everything for him that he definitely he never had a backup plan like cuz if i didn't do this for him like he 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 didn't even give himself enough time to do it for himself it was just you know i would do it there was no question about it so when i suddenly started turning up and saying i can't he was like what do you mean you can't you have to you know and and that was scary for me because because then i was like oh gosh this isn't working uh, like he, he does expect me to do everything for him it was it was very scary for me but i realized afterwards that it was just that he was just so unaccustomed to this response that he didn't you know he really didn't know how to respond to that but when i stuck with it he started finding his own solutions and he wasn't mad with me at all he just he accepted that i i couldn't do it and now it's it's one of my favorite skills i just i love saying i can't do everything <laughs> It's, it it's still so gratifying even now when i say i can't and he just you know moves on it's still so gratifying for me to see that i don't have to do it i don't have and, to do everything and this wasn't part of your vocabulary before a bit not at all in the past it, it's not like i used to jump up and do everything with a, with a smile not at all i used to i used to complain i used to grumble i used to uh mope I used to sulk. <laughs> I used to frown. I used to do all of that stuff. And I thought it was pretty obvious that I was stressed, you know, why else would I be complaining and moping? So, you know, and he wasn't responding to any of that. So clearly he didn't care. <laughs> But, you know, actually it was just the words made such a big difference. I had no idea. So you have a lot more time. You you do a lot less it sounds like overall. Yeah. Oh yes. Uh so I can plus receiving it's a very powerful combination <laughs> cuz now he just you know whenever he offers to do things to me for me which he has always done uh but you know part of being a perfect wife was refusing those uh you know refusing those <laughs> um offers because you know the perfect wife wouldn't make her husband do anything for her but now receiving is great. He just he just jumps up to do so many things for me. It's it's wonderful. <laughs> Wow. Wow. So it must feel very luxurious to be so taken care of now while you're doing a lot less. It does. It does. Um, it absolutely. And so and what would you say to a woman who now wants to create the kind of relationship that that you're enjoying where he's doing so much for you and he doesn't expect you to work your fingers to the bone and he you know says oh he's calling you and he means pretty woman pretty woman wh- how, where should she start well i would say self care because um that's where for one thing that's where my journey started uh but also just you know the the person that i was i didn't even know that i was supposed to tune into myself and ask myself what i wanted at any point of time i thought it was always about what the other people wanted what the people around me wanted and i i never realized how doing that was making me show up negatively like show up as a you know as, as the grumpy person as the irritable person in my marriage as the you know as a momzilla or whatever other whichever other ways i was showing up in my marriage and my uh, even as a mom but yeah self care has has it has been instrumental in my journey just uh being able to do all the other skills it just started with taking care of myself asking myself what i wanted and taking care of me really so yeah and what would you say to resina from before you know back when you didn't know what you know now what would you share with her the first thing i would tell her is that there is a solution you don't have to suffer it doesn't have to be like this because the old resina thought that i would just she would just have to live with the situation there was nothing that she could do about it because it was out of her control <laughs> but you know weirdly enough she she didn't relinquish control <laughs> at some level she knew it was not in her control but she still felt like she had to control it so yeah i would just tell her that there is a solution um don't worry it's going to be you know it it's going to get much better and yeah i would i would just give her hope yeah it reminds me of that part of the serenity prayer like there's the serenity to accept the things you cannot change but there's also the courage to change the things you can change and it's it sounds like you found your courage to change a few things in your marriage yeah yep 
Yeah. The the old me just I, yeah. So part of the reason I didn't want to accept that I I had a troubled marriage was because I didn't think that they that I could do anything about it. So I, it was easier for me to just say I'm not you know there's no problem in my marriage and just you know go along. It, it, that was much easier to do. So yeah. Yeah, but you were suffering even though you were saying that to yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Was still the, the I suffering. was suffering. What's going on? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even realize how much I was suffering until I stopped. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like I said, I didn't I didn't realize how much I was missing. I had no idea. Yeah. And these are these are really personal matters, right? And um you fundamentally had a good marriage, but now here you are sharing about some of the pieces that were uh where you were suffering and you're sharing with us very very vulnerably. Why would you do such a thing? Well, First, for somebody else who's in a similar situation like me, I guess I just want her to know that, uh, I, I guess I just want her to tune into those feelings that she's ignoring. So th- I don't know, there are so many layers to my story because, you know, part of, I guess another part of me not accepting that I was suffering was just that I never spoke about it to anyone. Uh, I didn't want, you know, because if I'm suffering, then, you know, I have to, you know, I have to, like like I said, I have to do something about it. And doing something is probably admitting to somebody that I'm suffering. And I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to talk about it. So there were, there were just so many layers to it. So I guess this is just to let somebody else who's in a similar situation to me, uh, just let her know that you know if you're suffering there are things that you can do that is completely in your power and you don't you know it's it's it can be it doesn't have to be counseling it doesn't have to be you don't have to get you know a whole bunch of people involved it's just about you you can you can change things that you do and it can change your entire marriage it, that is so empowering that, that that just that idea is so empowering to me the crazy thing is I always used to think that when my husband used to talk about, you know, what he wanted my family to do differently, I would always think, you know, if you want me to do something differently, I could do it. Like, why, why do you want me to, why do you want my family to do things differently? And I had no idea that it, that the solution would be about me doing things differently. I, I, I never dreamed it. <laughs> oh, I love the irony of that, of that insight that you have now. And it is, it does sound very empowering and you sound so empowered yourself, Rosina. So it's, it's really inspiring to hear your story. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing it thank with you. us. Thank you so much for having me. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at getcherished.com. Go to getcherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. And now it's time for the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award. It's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice. Yeah, it's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week. And the advice that's repulsing me this week is, if you communicate your wants and your partner ignores them or can't meet them, You should leave. Honoring what's non-negotiable for you is the cornerstone of healthy self-esteem. So the subtext of that is that if you tell him what you want and he doesn't do it, then it's proof there is no hope. You should just end your marriage, break up your family, find a new phone plan. You have to leave or it will show that you have low self-esteem. So you better do what you want because that is non-negotiable. And of course, feeling like your husband cares about what you want is part of feeling loved. Obviously, it is. Who wouldn't want that? We all want that. And you shouldn't have to live with someone who's dispassionate about you. That's not right. That's not part of feeling desired and taken care of and special. But what if you think you're telling him what you want and actually you're not? Because that's what I used to do. And so many students used to do that too. And one thing about this advice that jumps out at me as terrible, besides that, you know, casual, you should leave part, is how this expert talks about your wants 
and honoring what's non-negotiable interchangeably, right? Your wants, non-negotiable. But I see an important distinction between those two. I used to collapse them too. I used to say things like, we need a new couch. What I actually need is air, water, food, sleep. I wanted a new couch, but I thought that if I said we need, it would make my husband take it more seriously. He'd make it a higher priority if it was a need, but over-dramatizing it like that didn't really work. Saying we need, it was not honest, and it wasn't inspiring either. If I had been honest, I would have expressed my desires in a way that inspires. I would have said, I would love a new couch. That's when I get the best response from my husband because he loves to be my hero. When he hears a chance to make me happy, he usually seizes on it. Unless he's busy defending himself from my criticism, maybe for not doing anything about our couch situation, even though I've been complaining about it for months. Of course, complaining is not the same as saying what you want. And until I realized the difference, I thought I, thought I was telling him what I want and he just didn't care. But I was completely wrong. I wasn't even telling him. And as Mick Jagger says, you can't always get what you want. I have so much now that I once only dreamed of, but there will always be things that I desire that I don't have yet. I mean, I hope there are anyway, because first of all, I love the feeling of anticipation and looking forward to something new. But instead of blaming my husband when I want something and I don't have it yet, now I try to look at what is it about me that's stopping me from having what I desire. And there, right on my own paper, I always find the issue. (laughs) Like when I found out I wasn't getting attention and affection from my husband because I was a prickly porcupine wife, I was critical. I was complaining when I was trying to communicate my wants. I, I thought they were the same. And when I wasn't getting a pool... It was because I felt guilty and vulnerable, admitting that I would really love one. And when I didn't get a new couch because I was focused on not enough and I was experiencing lack, I thought that was his fault too, but it really was all right there on me. In other words, it wasn't so much that my husband wasn't giving me things that are non-negotiable. It was that I didn't know how to allow myself to have them yet, and it was convenient to blame my husband for what I lacked. Now, imagine if I had taken this very common advice to leave him because I thought he couldn't or wouldn't do what I wanted him to do. Instead of feeling desired, taken care of, and adored like I do now, I'd be divorced. I'm so grateful that's not what happened, but it very nearly did. Makes me shudder to think about. And for that reason, the advice that if you communicate your wants and your partner ignores them or can't meet them, you should leave, honoring what's non-negotiable for you as the cornerstone of healthy self-esteem, that is the very worst relationship advice I've heard all week. Listen and subscribe to the Empowered Wife Podcast. Next week, we'll talk about how to attract your husband in bed. In the meantime, I hope you're having lots of fun. Today's fun fact is that I'm descended from a Scottish clan and I have the toothpaste tube squeezer to prove it.